multiple choice time. You guys ready? The number one place to start a successful business is A, a dorm room, B, a garage, C, a corporate office, or D, an apartment. I, I know what you guys are thinking. You're thinking dorm room because Mark Zuckerberg founded Facebook in his dorm at Harvard. Maybe you chose garage knowing that Hewlett and Packard started the computer and printing giant in a teeny tiny garage. But if you picked apartment, well, that's the ticket. Alibaba, now with a $680 billion market cap, was founded in an apartment in Hangzhou, China. Airbnb, founded in a San Francisco apartment. And finally, Bantam Bagel started in, you guessed it, an apartment in the Big Apple. Don't know the name Bantam Bagel? Well, okay, you do, because if you've ever had a bagel at Starbucks, you know them. You've got to hear the extraordinary story of how founders Nick and Elise Oleksak climbed to the top of the bagel food chain in a most unique and inspiring way. Let us Welcome both of them right now, Nick and Elise, to hear their incredible story. Great to have you on Everyone Talks to Liz. Thanks for having us. I like the idea of the of the bagel food chain. Like that's a that's a cool image. I love that. I, I will give credit to my producer, Tanya Joseph, for that. <laughs> she wrote that out. The way the world works, it's a very crowded space, isn't it? It, oh, it yeah. definitely is. It definitely is. And I think, you know, from the beginning, we were looking, you know how to create something that was just so unique within that space, you know, that's been established, especially in New York for so long. So, um, you know, that's why the idea of Bantam Bagels got us so excited because of how unique and different and exciting it was within that humongous landscape. I want to hear the let's start in an apartment story. How did that all begin? <laughs> Elise, I mean, I'm thinking Isn't everybody's it more squished. About, let's get out of the apartment and find <laughs> our way out. Yeah. <laughs> So the story began, so we met in college and we found ourselves in very typical careers, Wall Street, um, both of us. And we were, we're, we were college athletes. We're always hustling. We're always looking to do something. We, we always say that in our blood is get on the end line and sprint until you puke. <laughs> that's, that's how you win the game, right? And that's how we've hustled our way through Bantam Bagels. It's been one step at a time, end line sprints until we just found our way. But um, we were really inspired by Shark Tank, believe it or not, at the beginning. It was when Shark Tank was first on air. And the idea of starting something by yourself and actually, you know, make, making your own career was something that was brand new to us at the time. I mean, so I think it was like, Shark Tank just embodies the American dream. Like the idea of going out, starting your own thing, taking that major risk and just having success in doing so just seems like such an amazing fairy tale to try right. to go out and live. And now um, it's so obvious, but back then it was much more obvious to just work in Wall Street or work a corporate job. So anyway, we were inspired by that. Nick would come home every single night and say, I got it tater tots like, and she would be like, like stop uh, stop coming home with no. bad ideas like <laughs> finally idea after idea and you know you, you know either you know that guy or you've been that person everybody's been inspired and nick was that guy and finally he called me in the office one day and said i got a uh mini bagel stuffed with cream cheese it's like dunkin donuts but a bagel and i just stopped hold the phone moment i love this okay so munchkins but in bagel form Wait, you know, as I'm hearing you say this, no pun intended, but your idea seems more of a, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I mean, it wasn't like you were passionate about making artisanal mini bagels. You were in search of an idea yeah. that would fill a need consumers didn't know they had. I mean, how did you come up in your mind with the mini stuffed bagel balls? Well, when you're an entrepreneur, remember, you, your ideas come from your own need. So we loved bagels. We grew up with bagels. We lived in New York City for 12 years. Like we know how important and how iconic a bagel is. Like everyone swoons over a good bagel. And the thing was, it was one of those foodie problems. I want a bagel, but I don't want to die or I don't want to have to skip dinner. I don't want, <laughs> I want this flavor, but I can't have both flavors at the same time. And it was one of those foodie conundrums. And this was right at the beginning when New York City became a real foodie, explosive environment, and people were looking for really unique twists on iconic things. Like, you remember the Cronut back in the day? Oh, yes. Yeah, like, that was one of our peers exactly that same year. So we, what we were doing was, you know, we were 
we were part of this brand new foodie culture at the time in New York City. And we just happened to glom onto something that we very personally connected to, yeah. bagels. And we found that it was such an obvious answer to an, a very obvious problem. You yeah, know, the, the cronut, for those of you who don't live in Manhattan, was the <laughs> croissant meets the donut by Dominique Ansel, who had created it. Um, they're not as popular anymore. Were you worried about your stuffed bagel balls being hot and then not? I mean, I think from our perspective on it, we just wanted to make it successful and had, like, we weren't thinking two years out. We were thinking, like, two weeks out. Like, how can we build this successfully, you know, going through this process in just, like, a very small you know, moment in time to make that successful. I think once we got, I mean, Elise and I literally were making bagel dough in our apartment and told no one about it. Like we would literally come home from work, make dough, put it in our closet to proof, roll them into little balls that next morning and like boil them in a, like a boiling vat of water on our stove. And no one knew about it because like we wanted to make sure that what we were about to embark on was the right product. We wanted to make sure that it actually was that good. Who did you enlist as your taste testers? Uh, friends oh, and family. Friends, we, were family. St we were stuffing bagels yeah. down people's throats, like whether they wanted it or not, for months. <laughs> oh my God, we made so many bagels. We found Frank the bagel guy. I mean, you have to be inventive and connect with underground people when you're looking at the New York City food world. So I would walk into bagel stores and just say, can I talk to your manager and talk to the manager and say, where do you guys make your bagels? And then I would show up at those factories and ask if yeah, I could, oh yeah. Uh, yes, oh yeah. say, can I learn a little bit from you? And then we found Frank the bagel guy who helped us refine our formula. Once we had the perfect bagel, he helped us figure out how we could commercialize it, right? like how we could make that in big batches because they well, get before we get to the up and running on the assembly line i'm dying to know <laughs> that sort of hit and miss trial and error part of the actual journey yeah. you know how do you get the, the cream cheese inside the bagel ball without seeing the dimple where it went in and because i'm always looking at the dunkin not... donut that's filled with jelly i'm like aha I see it. <laughs> Uh, that part's mostly magic, um, you know, just from a, from a development standpoint, we use a lot of, you know, magic and, and pixie dust, but no, it was, it definitely was a lot of trial and error. It was a lot of, you know, we ate a lot of bad, I guess I'll use air quotes, bagels um, in the early stage of the development, but literally we, we started with Googling how to make a bagel. Like we had no background in baking, baking anything. We just love this idea so much. We wanted to just figure it out on our own and like really dive in. So we were making batch after batch after batch and tinkering and changing, you know, yeast content levels and salt levels and, you know, the water concentration level, all things that I'm now sitting at my Wall Street trading desk, Googling like yeast strains. And my boss like turns and looks at me like, what are you, you even doing? Here. Like, what is wrong with you? Like you're, you're like, you're not even looking at anything that's going on with the markets right now. You're Googling like the best place to buy King Arthur flour. Like just why are, <laughs> what is going on? Um, but it really, it started as simple as that. Just like Googling how to make a bagel. The two of us just tinkering with it back and forth. And we were filling them with turkey basters. Right. That's like literally idea. like pushing a turkey baster like against my stomach in our kitchen to fill like the first one, I left a post-it note, put it on the counter, and I said, this is it, try it, like, yeah. we've got it. I um, love this it. story. But it doesn't, it doesn't start, it, right now, we have, of course, we have a major manufacturing facility with automated filling and, you know, all this equipment, but if you ask, like, how did you get there? We started with the turkey baster, and then when we opened the shop, we used donut fillers. We use what we had. We use whatever we could access. We just in, we reinvented equipment used for other things to fill our need. I want our listeners to take note. <laughs> exactly, Elise just made such a brilliant point. Just start. It's not going to be pretty. It'll be trial and error. There will be failures, but then when you really felt you had something, it was let's get on ABC's Shark Tank. And how did that happen? Because a lot of people want to get on that show. Right. We... It, it was well before that. <laughs> and also, um, 
we, I know Nick is very humble and says, oh, we just took it one day at a time, but we're visionary. We said, <laughs> we're, we want to change the way America bagels. We believe that this idea has such big legs. We said, we're going to be in Starbucks one day. And we were just set for, we want to change the way that people eat their bagels. So the shop was the way that we, if we could make it there, if the bagel could be approved in New York City, then we could make it anywhere. So as we opened up that shop, we set our sights on approval. So it wasn't about Dominique Ansel had this amazing strategy where he limited his quantity. So it was so exciting to stand like, yeah. but we did yeah. the opposite. We wanted every single person to sink their teeth into our bagel so that it became a commonplace, a new way to eat it. So we made them available for everybody. We, um, we started talking to magazines and to the Today Show and just getting it in like a lifestyle format where people were talking about our bagels, not necessarily only as like a food and wine, you know, creative food, but as something like this is part of my life now. So that is really mm -hmm. how we developed like this connection with our food. Like we had the New York City authenticity, we had the product that was real, real deal, and we had our roots in New York, but we made sure we were talking about it in like a way that people could change their lifestyle. I think that goes back, Liz, to your question about, you know, did we have fears about the Dominic Ansel, like this super hot item having tons of buzz around it and then kind of fizzling out or maybe, you know, being susceptible to that next big food item that may, you know, come on the scene. And I think to Lisa's point, like our focus and what we were so passionate about was everyone knows what a bagel is. Everyone knows how to eat a bagel with cream cheese. Everyone has that kind of in their blood, especially in New York. <laughs> like everyone knows what that product is. And we were just making something that made that entire process easier and more approachable. And it fit kind of the handheld on the go, easy to eat, better for you direction that the American consumer was just going in in general at the time. Yeah. Um, you know, so we just felt like we were in our path and we just had to put our foot on the gas and just hit it. But all entrepreneurs come up against that moment. And we've talked to, speaking of Shark Tank, Damon John, who founded FUBU in his mother's basement with one sewing machine and a couple of friends and a couple of yards of fabric. And FUBU became a huge um, hip hop clothing company and brand. But there came a point where he needed to go get capital to run this thing and to grow it because he got popular enough that they couldn't be sitting there with the foot pedal and the thing and the thing, you know, with their friends hawking it on the street corners. Oh, yeah. So they had to get investors. Back then, there was no Shark Tank. But here's Shark Tank in front of you on Friday nights. And what did you do? It was like our North Star. I mean, we applied five times. Yeah. We sent in videos. But like, applied like a handwritten application. Handwritten. Like mm -hmm. it was like, you know, 1987. We were like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we put together videos. We sent them all the press we had gotten. It was no small thing to be selected. And then once we were selected, we took that more seriously than I swear we studied for our SATs. We watched every single episode from history to date, wrote down every question, quizzed each other on how would we answer them. We would walk through the park and do, do like a financial review, you know, just nonstop studying, studying, studying. We we didn't go in there for the publicity. We went in there for the deal and for the partnership. And the truth is, it a business is a series of relationships. A business does not exist or operate successfully on an island. You mm. need yeah. people. Like people are the world, you know, and you have to remember that's that exists most importantly in business. And we knew that a hundred percent of you know, or like having the whole business, but not yeah. growing. Well, 100% really of, zero of zero is zero. zero. Right. Right. You know, so, and, I, and I think that was our perspective. And with Shark Tank specifically, we just believed in it so much. We believed in what it stood for. We believed in what we thought we were going to get out of it. And we went into right. it, you know, basically hearts open, all right. of our cards on the table like that. This was our moment, like to your point, yeah. this was the inflection moment in the business. <laughs> How are we going to go in and be as successful as possible in front of these, you know, pros, business people in in, in the world? You know, so you know. went in uber prepared. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's ballsy to shove yourself in front of the sharks. Um, and Lori Griner, 
comes through. She ends up offering 275000 but she took a significant chunk of equity in return, what, 25%. 25%. Why did you agree to that? I think it goes back the to value, 100% of yeah. zero is zero. You the know? value is so much bigger. The value that she's given us and the connection with that show, so much bigger than any percentage, doesn't matter. I mean, you, it, that's one of the most important things that we learned on our journey, journey is not to be my, myopic about our ownership mm -hmm. or our little insular team. Like you bring in the right people, you make the right decisions, you must be smart about it. But if you sit there on the island alone, then you're just, it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, because I think, I mean, you hear the stories about, you know, successful entrepreneurs early in their journey, having opportunities to, you know, sell off a portion of the company and, you know, gain significant equity, you know, to either boost the business or personally, you know, put themselves in a great place. And they decide not to because they feel like there's so much more in the business, so much more for them to do before they sell out. But we didn't look at it as selling out. We looked at it as, how are we leveraging our community of successful business people right. to be Even a bigger, bigger, better right. business? Yeah, and it worked because immediate, well, relatively immediately, doors start opening. Yep. Let's talk about Starbucks. At what yeah. point did that come in? So the, so Starbucks is literally one of my favorite stories in this entire journey we've had. <laughs> so, you know, picture, you know, little Nick and Elise sitting at our apartment table in Brooklyn and literally every two weeks we go, okay, who needs to have Bantam bagels? Let's go on LinkedIn and find every food and beverage person in that company's organization and blind email them. So we would literally every week just go on LinkedIn and blind email major corporations, food and beverage teams. So that's what happened with Starbucks. I mean, we literally were like, could there be a better customer for us, partner for us to do that? And so we get their email combo and we email them out and we get an email back from Chris Flett, who is the regional director of all of New York City. And he was like, oh my gosh, I saw you on Shark Tank. So like, that's it. I saw you guys on Shark Tank. I've had your product. I love your product. I have a funny story for you. Anytime we bring either Starbucks partners or, you know, people from outside of the country into New York for Starbucks business, we go to three places downtown. We go to our Starbucks at Christopher Street stop on the one train. We walk around the corner to Bleecker Street and go to Bantam Bagels. And then we go to our Starbucks on Bleecker. And we're like, yeah. Was that me? Oh we came my. in, but it wasn't that easy. They made us work for right. it. Right. And then the caveat at the end of the email was, but we're a humongous yeah. company. This is going to take a really long time, but I love the idea of doing a local regionalized product play. Like we've thought about doing this for a while and that's how it started. And so they allowed us to sell in three stores, but they said, but you have to deliver it and you have to sample at all the stores. So we showed up, us and his younger sister who still works for us, she's now a director of operations. <laughs> um, we hand sampled week after week after week at three Starbucks. We handmade our own signage. We met the baristas, we would go behind, bacon gouda for Julie, yeah. bantam bagels for Nick. <laughs> it was like all hands on deck. It was the hu bantam hustle, the source number one. Yeah, like Those the stores had like this little handmade bantam bagel <laughs> sign like in each bakery case. And we would carry a backpack around the city with backup signs yep. because inevitably like one got thrown out or be in the trash. So we hit every store like three times a day, be like, oh, you guys don't have a sign? Oh, we have one, here's one, take that. Yeah, oh, Imagine yeah. that, here's a sign. Those, those yeah. three stores turned into 30 stores. We did the same exact thing to all 30 stores, only it was, you know, 24 hours a day. And how many stores are you in today? <laughs> We're in 8,900 across the U.S. Stop. Yeah. The whole, the whole yeah. corporate franchise. And we that was, I mean, that was kind store. of just yep. the way we, started going about the business and the way we still do it today is just hustling harder than anyone else and you know doing anything possible to make you know the deal successful to get the deal to get in front of the right people just you know that was kind of the way we built the business you're listening to everyone talks to liz with the founders of bantam bagels we'll be right back after this how many people do you employ today we're team we're still pretty small our team is i think nine nine or 10 right now? Right, that's our core team. But the way that we've been able to scale so fast is we outsource a lot. Mm -hmm. So we have a manufacturing partner that's not technically owned by us. Got it. Um, our co-manufacturer, 
they have like 60 people. Then we outsource our warehousing, you know, so we outsource a lot of functions that some larger companies may build from the ground up and it, it takes longer. It's smart for a big business, definitely higher margin. But, you know, when you're looking for speed, the outsourcing model has been very effective for us. So now how many flavors do you have and what's happening on the horizon? So we are just an endless hub of innovation. Nick's energy of idea after idea has not simmered. So since launching the Bantam bagels, the mini stuffed cream cheese bagels, mm -hmm. we then launched mini stuffed scratch made pancakes with maple butter creams on the inside. After mm -hmm. that, we launched more breakfast innovation, which is our mini stuffed bagels with egg and cheese on the inside. Mm. And just now. So basically like imagine an <laughs> uh, egg and cheese sandwich just stuffed inside of a mini portable bagel. Uh, and we're, we're, bagel. Actually, we're actually launching a sausage egg and cheese and bacon egg and cheese kind of add on to that line this fall. Are you guys going to start feeding the tuna fish the actual mayonnaise before it's caught? I mean, this is just insane. I love this innovation. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, it's not a one idea wonder. I mean, something that's portable and authentic and just genuinely delicious doesn't mm -hmm. go out of style. Like we're really just taking people's and especially now with everybody working from home, I mean, it used to be about portability, but now it's about just finding things that feel real. Like you can't go to a bakery right now. You can't go to all these places where you just feel like you're getting something that's real, authentic, you know, no matter what, even though we're from in the freezer section, we flash freeze right off the line. And then it comes to you, you oh, cool. defrost and toast them. They taste as if they were baked that morning. So, I want to get to the personal aspect of this, because as you were creating this business, you were also trying to start a family. Yeah. That's a huge challenge. A yeah. lot of people say, you know what, I'm putting off the family for now, and I'm pouring everything into the business. So, you know, I'm not a good pregnant lady, <laughs> so I think it was a good distraction for me to get through it. I mean, it was... It, you just, I, I, sometimes we're the kind of people that we just do everything. You just do it. If this feels like the right time, we're just going to do it. And it felt like the right time to have a kid. He certainly, I think he hit 20 states before he was one because he would, we just threw him in the baby carrier and took him everywhere we went. I think that people say, how do you work with your spouse? That's how we made it work because we were together all the time. So even though we had a baby, yeah, we could, you know, balance that work and life at this very same time without, you know, having to leave our kid for weeks on end while we traveled. I would say for us, like the, the work life balance, we never looked at it as a balance. We just looked at it as what it was. Work and life were the one and the same, you yeah. know, and I think for us, we wanted to start a family and it was kind of like, you know, there's no better time than now, you know, this business isn't going to stop growing. And, you know, we are so much wanted to have a family too. So we're like, screw it. We're doing both at the same time. This is who we are. Like, let's go. Um, and I think that's just kind of a, a testament to our personalities. And I think, you know, Elise is literally the hardest working person I've ever met. And she was literally on her due date with our first, with our first son in the bakery in the city, like working. And like a customer was like, oh my gosh, when are you due? She's like, Oh, today. Yeah, it's, it's today. Today's the day. Yeah. Of course he didn't come that day. No, no, he was late. But. Yeah. Of course. They always make us wait, don't they? All right. So in 2018, October, you do something that I don't know if you were ready to do or you said now is the right time, but you sold it. You sold Bantam Bagels to Lancaster Colony subsidiary Team Marzetti. Yeah. yeah. For what? Yeah. More than 30 mil? How did you know it was the right time to sell? Oh, um, we, so we were outgrowing, uh, our sales were outpacing our cash flow. I mean, that's like what you discussed earlier. So, you know, for example, you send a PO in the food world, you offer free fill for your placement there, mm -hmm. and you have to pay your manufacturer. Um, and then two orders later, you're still shipping, you're still yeah. paying, you're not getting that cash in return right. until like at least four or five months. So you're always chasing your tail and it's like, you know, why businesses, why Shark Tank is so appealing. Um, but the, we were growing so, so, so fast that there were certain things that 
cash flow was the beginning of it where we said let's start looking at um capital investment let's start lo like looking into what that would look like but because we were going so fast as we were talking to people um private equity different companies we realized that we actually couldn't wait for the money and to build things on our own we were going so fast that we needed the infrastructure that was ready to rock if we wanted to make the most of this thing marzetti was literally i mean it was an emotional connection at the onset it was just we it was like hugging hello before it, we even hugged goodbye. it was like that you know like you hear the stories about like you walk on that college campus and you're like yep this is yeah, it this is, this all, is, this is, this is i'm all, here like yeah. mom and dad canceled right. the other tours like <laughs> right. we're going here this is it Kismet. The yeah, emotional connection exactly. was there. And then as we started peeling the onion, you know, we're show, sharing them our needs for growth. It's plug and play. It's so obvious, the connections. They're already in Frozen. They've got the warehousing. They have the engineers. All the stuff that would take us years, despite capital investment, to develop, we mm -hmm. would end up lagging behind. And we had no, we were not planning on losing any of the momentum that we had built. This thing is still a rocket ship. Yeah, and I think one of the things that, just made the Marzetti partnership so perfect for us was from like meeting number one, their CEO was like, I understand the value of the entrepreneur and I understand the value of the founder in a business. I 100% am not going to take that away from you and from this business. We are going to let you run in a autonomous way and we are going to give you all the support you need. Which was for us like mind blowing to think that someone you know who's running a you know over a billion dollar company would take a look at our business and have that perspective. Because sometimes it doesn't exactly work as you would hoped. You know, we've had the entrepreneur Dave of Dave's Killer Bread, where private equity took a big stake and things because yep. they were growing so fast. I mean, this guy had been in prison. He starts right. a bread company. The next thing right. you know, he's huge. Uh, but it seems like this is very much a, a perfect fit because you can continue doing exactly what you were doing as passionately as right. you have. Right. But better because we learn as we go mm -hmm. and we know mm -hmm. that we can only learn if we have good mentors to learn from. So we used to seek out mentors like in our customers, you know, a Starbucks contact became a mentor of ours anywhere we would go and in Marzetti because we had such an emotional connection and there were so many similarities. We were like, these are the mentors for us. We can, we know, we can, I mean, it was just, and I think they felt the same way. Just like we were looking for people who could also help us strategically. It's so cool because you're young. I mean, how old are you guys? If you don't mind me asking, because 30, I'd like to let our viewers. 30, yeah, okay. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. Yeah. okay. All right. So you got a big runway here uh, ahead of you. What's next? What kind of deals are you looking at? What is your next sort of Starbucks in the sky? Yeah, I, I, that's a really great question. And I think, you know, we talk about it every day. We, we are looking, we don't think we're done or even close. Like we feel like our partnership with Marzetti, we've just, just now scratched the surface of what we can do together. Um, and I think our biggest kind of outside of where we're at now is like other food service. Like how can we take these items which just live and succeed so well in Starbucks and look at how can we be in college and university cafeterias? How can we be, you know, expanding out beyond, right. you know, the, the grocery store environment and how are we continuing to be that everyday item in places where, you know, the college students right now are the, the people who saw us on Shark Tank in 2015. Like right. that's, you know, that's who our customer is now as they're going to school. Like how can we meet our customers where they are? And we think, you know, expanding into that food service environment is, you know, an amazing way to do that. I just want to point out too, for our listeners, I interview Warren Buffett a lot and Warren Buffett doesn't care about MBAs. He says, I don't need to hire MBAs. I don't need to hire people with high, high IQs because I'm pretty sure that some of the guys who got us into financial crises in the past had really high IQs. <laughs> um, neither of you guys had an MBA. Right? No, I mean, Bantam was our MBA. Yeah, really was live business school. So I want people to hear that and say, you don't necessarily need to spend six figures on a degree right now in a very challenging time. You just got to find that idea and then what, never say die? 
I mean, literally do anything possible and even beyond that to make your dream a success. So the motto we've always lived by is say yes and make it happen. That first QBC order, she ordered 30,000 bagels in two weeks and all we had was like we were baking literally feet. in a space the size of this Zoom box. Like and it was like, it was like that small. We, we said yes, we hung up, we had one oh you know what moment mm -hmm. and we got to work. It, I was six months pregnant, I was fit, we were doing 24 hour shifts, we were uh, dry, personally driving bagels out to Long Island and all the way to the very last minute we pulled it off and ever since that first order it was like say yes and yeah. then figure it out. I think that's like the truest like entrepreneur moment is just, you know, that feeling of I can do anything. I can figure it out. I just have, if I get the opportunity, I have to grab it. Mm -hmm. um, well, you guys said from the beginning, I want to be in Starbucks. And I always say, if you can dream it, you yeah. can do it. Nick and Elise, what a great story. I love it because you didn't depend on anybody but your own selves and your excitement and good things have come to you. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you for joining you. us. Thanks for having us. Bantam bagels, little stuffed sort of munchkins meat bagel world, which is great for me because being Jewish, I love a really good bagel. Um, great for both of you guys. Thank you so much. And to our listeners, again, what a great and inspirational story that we have here to show that, you know what? Just go for it. Life is short. And thank you so much for joining us. And by the way, hello, our ratings on the Claim and Countdown are through the roof, Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern, because there are stories like this every single day. And then when you make your money, you got to watch your money. And that's what we do on Fox <laughs> Business and the Claim and Countdown. Have a great day. We'll see you next time. For more podcasts like this, go to foxnewspodcasts.com.